Welcome back to Joliet once again. This is the carriage shop here on Main Street. And this week was kind of a busy week in and out of the shop again. I was out one morning. I usually start about 5.30 and I've been building some fence out on a little place. Well, I came back to the shop about 8.30 and there was a set of wheels sitting here that had shown up that morning. They were from the Amish community down the road about 15 miles. Well, they needed some rubber. One wheel had thrown the rubber, the other was almost. And the front two wheels, they still had the rubber, but they were really falling apart. You know, there is a couple of rubber companies that specially make this rubber for buggy wheels. And there is difference in qualities. Well, this rubber is not a real high quality. It's a real soft rubber. So it makes it a nice ride, but it doesn't stand up well against the gravel road. So it's pretty chewed up. Now the Amish really like all fiberglass wheels, but this set of wheels is actually an all wood set of wheels. So I was kind of curious about how the tension of the tires was. And you know, it's a, the best way to tell whether a wheel is tight is to listen to it. So I drop it on concrete and listen to whether it has a nice solid ring to it or a flat rattle or a dead thud. These wheels actually have a nice sound to them. So I don't have to worry about setting the channel. I will just go ahead and put the rubber tires back on these wheels. Now this particular gentleman had the rubber tire on hand, so I'm going to put the rubber that he provided on these wheels. Well, this is going to be just kind of a quick review of putting rubber tires on. I've done a couple of videos on this before, and you can go back and check out this particular video more in depth of how rubber tires are installed on buggy wheels. When I started back in the wagon business back in 79 and I joined my brother-in-law Rick Bischoff who had already started working here, it had a type of nostalgic romantic aura about it. But as with most ventures, relationship, businesses, there's a type of a honeymoon for a period but then eventually that honeymoon wears off and reality shows up. And some of you have experienced that when you have found this channel that you know things were new and exciting but after you've watched video after video of building wheels you know you begin to realize it gets to be pretty mundane routine well you know some of you have commented that 
You'd watch even if I was showing knitting or you'd watch even if I read the phone book. Well, a couple of weeks ago I did a video on sanding and I come to find out, as I expected, that is probably pushing the limits of many of you who would like to watch this channel. Many of you fast forwarded, some of you even skipped it all together, which is fine. But you know, that's a sense of this business that is not romantic, doesn't have any nostalgia about it, but it is just the reality of part of this business. And so the reason why I showed it to the extent and detail that I did was not to show sanding, but to show the mental discipline of enduring the unpleasant in any type of business, you know, and that happens, we know, in relationships too. Not everything is always sunshine and roses. Sometimes there is storm clouds and rain. So anyway, I've got some more uh, sanding to do on this undercarriage, but before I do that, I need to go through and fill some of these heavy cracks on this old original wood. Now, it's, it's partly because I want to fill it for appearance, but mainly is I want to fill it against any type of moisture penetration. So I'm going to focus on that which might collect moisture and allow it to penetrate underneath this finish. Now, as soon as some of you see me sanding, you're gonna go, oh, no, no, not again. <laughs> but I've got more sanding to do. But this time, as I go through and sand, I wanna point out some little intricacies, little differences, and maybe some fuller explanations of some of the parts, purposes, whys and hows of some of these that, are, that I work on. You know, I don't always elaborate a lot. You know, I'm not real talkative in my videos, but maybe I can kind of fill in some of the gaps for some of you. Some of you that watch, this is old hat for you, but maybe this might help some of you that don't work with horses or spend all your life around buggies. So these ends on neck yokes are purely decorational. They're called an acorn end. And if you look at them, they kind of look like an acorn. It's just a stylish end way to finish them off. You know, they could be just round, square, flat, dull, boring. But you know, back in that day, people weren't any different than we are today. We don't buy just a square box with four wheels on it with a motor and say that's good enough. We like style and fashion and finesse, and they're no different back then. A lot of these things don't really have a functional purpose but they have a fashionable purpose. And that's what these neck yoke ends are. They're just purely fashionable. Well, this next piece is referred to as a single tree yoke. And if you think about a yoke, you might think about maybe a yoke of oxen or a marriage being yoked together or a, a team of horses being yoked together, you know, kind of a little different fashion. But this idea of a yoke is when you take two pieces and you unite them together in purpose. Well, this single tree yoke unites the single tree and the crossbar together so that they can function as a uniform set when this buggy is being pulled on the set of shafts. So the ends on these single trees are a spring-loaded end. We call them a premium single tree end and they are designed for hooking a harness that has heel chains, generally a working harness, to a buggy. And this spring-loaded end keeps the chains securely fashioned. Now there are some other style that are a little more commonly used for all leather traces, such as this, what we call a cocci end or a sword end. If you had all leather traces, this would be your choice. But for heel chains, a premium end or spring-loaded end, single tree end, is, is preferred. Now this is not a modern concept. This one here shows an old style that was cast out of steel, but the modern day ones today are cast in brass. 
Well, when the single tree is yoked together to the crossbar, in the case of a set of shafts, it swivels on what is called a single tree caster. So the pull is actually on the two plates of the caster and it is relieving the pressure from the bolt. So the bolt, all it does is keep the caster from coming apart. Well, the crossbar is named because it is simply that, the crossbar between the two shafts. And the width of the crossbar is determined where it attaches to the axle on the buggy. You know, the general width between center to center of the shafts at the axle is 43 inches, which puts the crossbar generally at 39 and a half to 40 inches. So the width of the crossbar determining the width of the shafts is actually determined by the buggy, not the horse. And where the crossbar is a mortise and tenon joint into the shaft, there is a plate placed on top to strengthen that mortise and tenon joint. Now underneath, I build my irons maybe a little more unique to incorporate another strengthening of that T weld. And it's not something that a lot of people do, the old style, some of those had it, but a lot of times you could put in a wood circle brace to strengthen or triangulate that mortise and tenon joint. And the tenon as it comes through this mortise joint is never cut off flush. Today you see some people doing that, but an old style is it's, it protrudes out about half, three eighths of an inch and is tapered down to this style of a, of a finish. Now I think we touched on this in the past because this box sets in front of the axle on this undercarriage that we're using a double bend style which pushes the single tree forward so that when the shafts are turned extreme right or left, the crossbar single tree combination does not hit the corner of the box. And once again, when a bolt is put right close to the end of the wood, a T-plate is placed underneath the carriage bolt and formed around the end to help uh, prevent that wood from splitting. There are some old bolts that this T-head was incorporated right into the bolt. But today it is a separate piece that's placed under a standard carriage bolt. And shafts, when they are bent, they are bent inward toward the front so that when the tip of the shafts comes in close to the girth where the, where the belly band would be, they can fit closer to the animal. Because on a single set of shafts, the horse actually has to push the shafts to turn the front axle. Well, about 42 or so inches ahead of the crossbar is a little loop placed underneath the shafts that are designed to hold the hold back loops that go to the britchens. The britchen is actually what the horse or mule will use to stop the buggy. So these loops have a little different style. I choose to use this footman loop style because I think it forces the person to put a leather strap through the loop instead of this other style that has a tendency to allow you just to snap into it. When you're stopping on this style of a hold back loop, you're only stopping on two or three screws. The purpose and the strength of the stopping is when you wrap these hold back loops to the shafts themselves. And this is one of the styles that is really common on tying a hold back strap to the shafts. So the purpose of the footman loop or the hold back loop is simply to keep the hold back strap in place while actually holding to the shaft itself. Some old shafts even just tacked a leather loop underneath, but it accomplished the same thing. The strap went through the loop around the shafts, not holding on the hold back loop itself. And on the tip of the shafts is oftentimes put a little metal cap. This one I put an all steel cap on that I can paint it, but there are those that come in brass, stamped brass, machine brass, stamped chrome, and even have stainless steel. Well, as we move to the pole, which is used for a team, out on the tip, which holds the neck yoke, is a pole tip or a pole cap. In this case, it's cast iron. Now the length of the tongue is determined by the horses that are going to be used to it. Now you understand when I say horses, this is going to be any animal that's going to be put to it. 
So the length is determined by the animals themselves in this case. Now in the case of the double tree, here some terminology sometimes gets changed. Uh, it just depends on what a person uh, grows up learning. We oftentimes, I call the whole assembly a double tree. Oftentimes people will say that the main bar, I would call the evener, is called the double tree of which the two single trees attach to. Doesn't really matter just as long as I understand your lingo. But this bottom bar, I'm going to call the evener, also swivels on a set of casters and the, the bolt that goes through it keeps the casters together. But instead of a yoke, this strap that goes on top is called the hammer strap. As they pull into the load, this hammer strap keeps the bolt from rolling forward. Some style of hammer straps are all together in one piece like this, is welded down into the T, all one piece, but there are some styles that are set individually that uh, will swivel on a bolt instead of being all one piece. And again, a common style, just like the double bend shafts, this will use a double bend pole. Now, as you watch me build this pole, you remember that the pole is a mortise and tenon joint as it attaches to the pole circle or the pole bow. Again, the tenon is left proud and tapered off. It's just purely a fashionable finishing edge or a finishing touch. And then the circle or the bow is what goes out to the eyes on each side where it will attach to the buggy axle itself. So what I'm calling the double tree here, the evener is designed to match the neck yoke so that the horses run parallel. The width of the evener determines how close or far apart the horses are to the pole itself. The width of the single tree now becomes determined by the size of the horse. Uh, on the shafts, the single tree was the same width as the crossbar or close. In the case of a double tree, the single trees now are fitted to the horse as well as the evener and the neck yoke are fitted to the horses, not the buggy. Now I made this evener out of ash and with my heavy coats of primer, you can see that the thickness when sanded down is filling this open grain in the ash. The ends of the evener are just another case where fashion wins over function. These could be rather boring, blunt ends, but again, we like fashion as well as function. Now I chose to use a different style of single tree yoke on this double tree where the yoke and the casters are a uh, combined assembly in this casting style as opposed to the separate yoke and caster that I used on the set shafts. And again, since we're going to use heel chains, a working style harness, we're going to put the same spring-loaded ends on these single trees. So this first go around of sanding this heavy coat of primer, what I called in the previous video sculpting, the whole goal is to fill the wood grain. Now when I put the second coat, series of coats, on these undercarriages and now the this pole and the shafts. My, my second time around sanding, I'm not going to be worried about filling wood grain. Now I'm going to be worried about filling sand scratches. What I sanded with 80 grit, now I'm going to sand with 320 on the undercarriage and the pole and shafts. Now when I get to the body where there are, where there are broader surfaces, I sand with 400. So the next step go around is sanding for scratches, not for wood grain. So maybe this helps uh, explain some of the different purposes of the individual styles. You now as I put these together, I don't, I don't blab a whole lot, but uh, maybe this kind of clears up and I tricked you into watching sanding while I did it. Anyway, appreciate you following along and thanks for watching.